ಸಿದ್ಧಸ್ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತೋ ಸಮ ಸಂಬುಟಸ ನಮೋಸ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತೋ ಸಮ ಸಂಬುಟಸ ಬುಟ್ಟ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ಧಮ್ಮ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ಸಾಂಗಾಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ದುಟಿಯಂಪಿ ಬುಟ್ಟ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ದುಟಿಯಂಪಿ ಧಮ್ಮ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ದುಟಿಯಂಪಿ ಸಾಂಗಾಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ಥಿಯಂಪಿ ಬುಟ್ಟ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ತುಟಿಯಂಪಿ ಧಮ್ಮ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ತಥಿಯಂಪಿ ಸಾಂಗಾಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ಪಾನಾತಿ ಪಾತ ವೈರಮಿ ಶಿಖಾಪದ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಿ ಅದೀನ್ನ ದಾನ ವೈರಮಿ ಶಿಖಾಪದ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಿ ಕಮೇ ಸುಮಿಚ್ಛಾಚಾರ ವೈರಮಿ ಶಿಖಾಪದ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಿ ಮೂಸಾವಾದ ವೈರಮಿ ಶಿಖಾಪದ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಿ ಸುರಮೇರಯ ಮಾಜಪಮಾದ ಥಾನ ವೈರಮಿ ಶಿಖಾಪದ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಿ ಸಾಧು 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 Now, first of all, I would like to do a reading on the, taking refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. And this is by Ajahn Sumedho. And in case you don't know who Ajahn Sumedho is, he was the, the first Western disciple of Ajahn Chah, the well-known Thai disciple. forest uh, monk hmm? <clears throat> refuge in the buddha what is a refuge a refuge is a place of safety a secure place where it is peaceful and sane not crazy insane and confused a place where there's understanding intelligence and harmony away from the world of confusion and disharmony craving and greed hatred and ill will ignorance and delusion because people's minds are restless and confused they're caught by craving resentment and delusion and so they take refuge in the wrong things they hurt and kill others they steal and cheat they compete with others and get angry and upset they say bad things and spread rumors people behave very selfishly only thinking about themselves and what they possess they only think in terms of me and mine their minds are caught in this illusion of self or ego and so they cause problems for themselves and for others most people do not understand themselves understand their own minds and the laws of nature and are therefore restless and confused constantly grasping and clinging to worldly things including to ideas concepts ideals views and opinions they do not know the dhamma the nature of the world and the way things are 
The more we understand the Dhamma through study, reflection, and meditation practice, mind training and cultivation, the more we realize the profoundity, the depth, and vastness of the Buddha's teachings. And it becomes a real joy, very exciting and wonderful to take the three refuges in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. And this inspires the mind. Many traditional Buddhists in countries like Thailand, Burma, and Sri Lanka constantly repeat or chant the three refuges during their ceremonies. But it's just habitual repetition of words. It doesn't mean much after a while. It's just a habit, a part of the ceremony. Similarly, the taking of the five precepts by the lay devotees has become a habitual part of the ceremony. It becomes empty and meaningless after some time. So they keep taking the five precepts of every ceremony and they keep breaking the precepts. Is nothing special. People do not bother to reflect, to think over, investigate, and actually find out what they mean, what refuge mean, what Buddha means, and so on. Just repeating words is not enough. We have to calm the mind first and then reflect, contemplate, and what they mean. The word Buddha is a lovely and inspiring word. It means the one who is awake, the one who knows intuitively, the person who is alert and wise, intelligent, clear and peaceful, patient, kind and compassionate. And the first refuge is in the Buddha as a personification, the human symbol and example of wisdom and compassion. What was the Buddha awake to? He was awake, alert, and sensitive to the problems, confusion, and suffering of the world. He understood the truth of existence and the nature of the human condition. When we take refuge in the Buddha, it doesn't mean that we take refuge in a person or in a god or some savior. We take refuge in that which is wise and intelligent sane, kind, and compassionate in the world, in human nature, in our own minds and hearts. It means that we dedicate ourselves to the noble path, to the way of understanding, peace, and wisdom. It means that we want to follow the, ex the Buddha's example, the example of Siddhartha Gautama, in seeking the highest truth so that our minds can be free of worry, fear, anxiety, sorrow, craving, hatred, and delusion, all aspects of mental suffering, and we can become peaceful and joyful human beings. The Buddha was a healer, a doctor of mental emotional problems, and in teaching the Dhamma, he wanted us to understand our own minds and to take responsibility for our own mental health and sanity and not to depend on others. He wanted us to awaken our own Buddha nature, our own wisdom mind. Some people worship the Buddha as a god, as a supernatural being, asking for good luck in business and family matters and then asking for more money and wealth. They pray and wave joysticks at the Buddha statue. This is only superstition caused by fear, uncertainty, insecurity, and craving, and desire. They want the Buddha as a powerful outside agent to help them fulfill their wishes and dreams. This is not the true meaning of taking refuge in the Buddha. Superstitious people also want charms and talismans to protect them from ghosts and spirits, anything which is harmful. They often ask monks to give them these things and they are willing to pay a lot for them. This is taking refuge in fear and superstition. 
And this doesn't help us because fear will come back again and again to trouble us. Dealing with fear takes a lot of awareness and insight. People in Western countries are now more modern and sophisticated. They don't take refuge in magic tar charms. Christians take refuge in the belief that there is a God and eternal life after death. People take refuge in money, in the bank, in the stock market, in lottery tickets hoping to win a lot of money. People take refuge in material possessions romantic relationships and sense pleasures. They believe that these pleasures will give them true and lasting happiness and security. Some take refuge in their physical beauty, good health and strength. But that is still taking refuge in things that offer no real safety because these things are impermanent, temporary and uncertain. These things and conditions around us and in us can change at any time. We cannot guarantee what will happen in the future. Life is uncertain, or we are changing. Only death is certain. Our bodies and physical looks have to change. We have to grow old, experience illness, and we all have to die someday. Our health and strength have to change. This is a law of nature. So there is no safety in the material or physical world. Our parents, spouses and children and friends also have to grow old and die someday. Taking refuge in the Buddha, in wisdom, in right understanding and view, when we understand the conditions of this world, when we live and act wisely, we can accept these natural changes, the ups and downs of life, with more peace, humility, and equanimity. This is our real place of safety, our real home, a peaceful and wise mind that understands and accepts the changing conditions of existence. This is the Buddha mind. Refuge in the Dhamma. It is to walk in the footsteps of the Buddha and other wise and noble beings, to follow their example. It is to devote one's life to spiritual growth and understanding, to clearly realize the nature of existence so that we, be we can become like the Buddha, wise, peaceful, patient, kind, and compassionate. The Dhamma is not separate from daily living. It is not a subject that you read in books about Buddhism and philosophy. It has to do with the nature of the world and the human condition, and not what our conditioned minds think or believe it to be. Our conditioned minds prevent us from seeing the world as it really is. It is limited and is caught in the illusion of thoughts, ideas, and concepts, and images. Hence, our confusion, greed, anxiety, fear, prejudices, anger, and so on. It is our conditioned mind that gives us problems. So taking refuge in the Dhamma is to follow the path of self-knowledge, wisdom, and freedom. The Buddha did not invent or create the Dhamma, some new philosophy about life. He was simply awakened, enlightened to the truths of existence, the laws of nature and the human condition, which existed before the Buddha and still exist today. So when we are awakened, when we understand the Dhamma, we too become Buddhas. We become timeless, unconditioned, and free. The practice of Dharma is not dependent on being a monk or a nun. It depends on right understanding and view. 
with right mindfulness. The Dhamma is t timeless, eternal truth or reality. It is beyond the conditioned mind, beyond the thinking process and the concept of self. It is always here and now, like the air and the sky. Refuge in the Sangha. Sangha means a community of monks and nuns, also lay devotees, a spiritual group of friends, people who can encourage and inspire you to lead a noble life towards wisdom and peace. The Buddha encouraged to have people to have noble friends for guidance, support, and inspiration. A teacher should be a noble friend and guide. Following the example of the noble ones, we do good deeds, avoid bad or unwholesome actions, and we purify the mind through training and cultivation, and we try our best to observe the precepts. We take refuge in virtue, in that which is good, decent, kind, generous, and compassionate. Patience is a virtue. We don't take refuge in those things in our minds that are mean, negative, nasty, cruel, selfish, jealous, hateful, and resentful, and greedy. In our relationships, we strive to be kind, patient, and understanding so that there is peace and harmony, less division and conflict. If somebody gives us problems, we don't hold a grudge. We don't get angry and cling to negative emotions. We make effort to let go of those negative states. We forgive and forget. We let go of conflicts and bad memories and hurt feelings. If we cling to these things, we only suffer. Our minds will not be peaceful. Our hearts will not be open and loving. We all have good thoughts and feelings, and sometimes bad thoughts and feelings. Conditions in the world are changing and impermanent. Good and bad thoughts and feelings come and go. They change. But we take refuge in virtue, in goodness rather than in hatred, resentment, and aversion, in negative conditions of the mind. We don't take refuge, we take refuge in our wholesome states of mind, which are kind, compassionate, and loving towards ourselves and others. Actually, when we reflect more, we begin to see that the real enemy, the real problem in life, are our own defilements and unwholesome states. Our anger and aversion, our pride, arrogance, selfishness, and so on. So refuge in the Sangha is a very practical, useful refuge in everyday living. We can have peace, goodwill, and harmony with others and with ourselves. We don't blame others for our problems, for the way we feel. We have to take complete responsibility for our mental, emotional states, for how, for how we live, for our speech and actions. It is so easy to blame others and point fingers. Sometimes we even blame our friends and family, our parents, politicians, our society, our country, and so on. When we take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, we realize that to blame ourselves for, the, for our problems, for the way we feel, is immature and a complete waste of time. We have to take responsibility for our own life and live it with intelligence and wisdom. Even if we had bad parents or poor parents, it still doesn't matter. There's no one to blame but ourselves. Our own ignorance, selfishness, pride, arrogance, and conceit. We forgive, we let go of those bad memories, here and now. 
we free the mind of defilements, unwholesome thoughts and feelings. This is the path of maturity, truth and peace. The path of wholesome living, mind training and cultivation and wisdom. Now, before the Buddha passed away, <clears throat> the, the monks and lay devotees who had wisdom, a right understanding, right mindfulness, and so on, they could accept the Buddha's death with peace, equanimity, compassion, and gratitude. But naturally, there were some monks and lay devotees who did not have that level of practice and understanding. So they were very sad, very upset. Some were crying, pleading with the Buddha, not to die, <laughs> not to leave them. And the Buddha reminded them that all things are impermanent, even teachers. He said, eventually, you have to be a light unto yourself. You have to be an island unto yourself. He said the real refuge, because teachers come and go, no teacher is permanent, that's obvious. So he said your true refuge is the four foundations of mindfulness, because when you understand this practice and you follow the four foundations of mindfulness, you're not so dependent on external teachers. And you may recall the Buddha kept reminding people that I can only point the way, but you have to make the effort to follow the path, to see the Buddha, to see the Dhamma, to realize the profound truth of Dhamma in your daily life. So this is why the four foundations of mindfulness are so important. Now, the, the way we are brought up, the way we are educated, we are not taught about the benefits of mindfulness, as you know. We are just taught to think, to study subjects, to read more, to think more, to speak more. And we think that to be intelligent means to think, you know, to read more, to think, to have more knowledge, hmm? namely book knowledge. And we are encouraged to study, 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 to pass exams, to be qualified. Uh, but as you may know, you can be very qualified in, in the worldly sense. You can be very professional at what you do. You can, you can also be highly paid. But you still don't really understand yourself, which is what wisdom is about, to understand really what is life all about, who am I really. Because regardless of how professional we are, 
we still suffer from ignorance and delusion, out of which comes, you know, craving, attachment, greed, aversion, ill will, hatred, resentment, jealousy, and so on. And we, we still cling to the idea of self, hmm? that who I am is, is something permanent, something separate from the world. And this is why humans have been asking this question for thousands and thousands of years. I call it the age-old question. And people are still asking this question today. And in future, people will still be asking the same question. And what is this question? What happens to me when I die? And where do I go after death? Hmm? You may have this, the same question <laughs> in your mind. <laughs> And of course, when we're trapped in, in thinking, in the intellect, that question is, uh, is bound to, uh, to happen. And because of the way we're educated to be intellectual, to think more, study more, speak more, we identify very strongly with our mental activity. And of course, we identify with our emotional states. And part of our education or conditioning is our habit of reacting. We're all taught this. We're caught in reacting all the time. First, we label things because we need labels to communicate. But then, because we don't have the awareness, the understanding, we get too attached to labels and we forget that labels are just labels. They're actually not the real thing. And then we judge, we criticize, we compare, sometimes we condemn, we like or not to like, we want or not to want, and then to have aversion, right? ill will, resentment, jealousy, and so on. So it is this conditioning that we all have is what creates our mental defilements. And this is why as human beings we all have mental defilements because it's a part of our education or conditioning. And what the Dhamma is showing us is that it is this habit of habitual reaction that is really creating our delusions. But initially we don't see that, we just see it as normal behavior. Because we all do this, it's a part of our education. And this is why the Buddha gave this very radical advice. When you see, just see, when you hear, just hear. Now, it sounds very simple, but as you know, it's very challenging because we've been reacting, you know, since early, early age. So this is why it's a very challenging practice. But with effort, we begin to see the benefits of it. Not reacting, especially to unpleasant situations or unpleasant words.
and it is the mindfulness, the practice of mindfulness, that helps us not to react hmm? so habitually. Hmm? But it does take practice. And in my own experience, I can see that whenever people get upset with me or angry with me, you know, including a few monks, <laughs> It's always a good opportunity for me to practice not reacting hmm, to people's anger. Because when you don't react to people's um, unpleasantness or negativity, you begin to see the freedom of it. And you see that they're behaving in an unpleasant way, simply because they are deluded, eh? they're suffering from delusion. And part of that delusion is always fear, because fear is one of our most deep-rooted mental states. I think I gave a talk here on fear, I think, 2019. It, it, it's all on YouTube, you can find it. Just go to Pantico with the Buddhist Gem Fellowship, you'll find it. Understanding the nature of fear. And during the pandemic, I could see very clearly that apart from the coronavirus, the biggest virus that, that the planet had to deal with was fear and paranoia. And it was primarily spread by the news media, right? Everywhere it was like this. And then, of course, the politicians were all all affected by all this fear and paranoia. And they themselves began to be behave in a very irrational way. Because fear, paranoia makes us very irrational. So when we begin to practice more mindfulness, more present moment awareness, we begin to have the trust, put more trust, more confidence in this practice. And you begin to see that mindfulness, present moment awareness, is actually more important than just our thinking, or mental activity. And when we do have more trust, more confidence in present moment awareness, mindfulness, this is a, the true refuge, hmm? the true refuge in our Buddha nature. So we learn how to think logically, rationally, when we need to think. And when we don't need to think, we can come back to present moment awareness. So there's order in the mind. Because as you know, even when we don't need to think, the mind keeps thinking automatically, doesn't it? Compulsively. It's like a machine that doesn't know when to... Uh, when to stop. It's like today, when we have a little free time, what we do, we go to the smartphone, right? <laughs> yeah. And I remember in Singapore, watching people having lunch. <laughs> And as you know, they're already very anxious, very impatient. And they cannot spend five, ten minutes just eating mindfully and just be peaceful. They're eating and they're busy scrolling, right? And if they're not scrolling, 
they'll eat for a moment, they stop, they put up the phone, check, 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 put it down, they start eating again for two minutes, they stop, they pick up the phone, check, 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 like this. And I'm wondering where human beings evolved, evolving into. <laughs> And I can see this very clearly because I don't have a smartphone. And you're looking at somebody who has never sent a text. I can type very well <laughs> on a keyboard, <laughs> but my thumbs can't, can't uh, type messages. So one of the, the aspects of, of wisdom is to understand what thinking is. Because it's something that is not taught in school and it should be taught in school. And this was one of the questions I began to ask when I was in school, what exactly is thinking? Because during high school, the mind became very disturbed. I was in a boarding school based on the British system. And by the fourth year, I wanted to leave. I wanted to leave that boarding school environment. And although I was very good in science and math and I had a good memory, I just felt that I needed to learn something more than just subjects. But of course, when you're 15 years old, you can't just leave school like that, right? Uh, but I was ready to leave school to travel the world in search. I was actually searching for the Dhamma. But the only book I had was the Bible because I grew up as a Christian. And as you may know, in Christianity, you're not encouraged to question. You just accept and believe what we call blind faith. And for some people, that is their path. But I was asking too many questions. So I realized I had to find something else. But I had to go all the way to India to find the Dhamma. And I remember looking at the mind and I began to ask, is it possible for all this mental emotional turmoil to stop? All this dukkha. But at the time I didn't know the word dukkha, but it was obviously dukkha. <laughs> I could see it very clearly. Is it possible for all this crazy, obsessive thinking to stop to become silent? Because I saw the connection between obsessive thinking and, of course, mental, emotional suffering, dukkha. And that's why I began to ask the question, is it possible for all this crazy thinking to stop what exactly is thinking? And during university days, I began to, to wonder about eternity. I was fascinated by that idea of eternity. What exactly is eternity? So going to India, and fortunately I met two people who had traveled to India and Nepal in the 1970s. And in those days, you could go through Europe, and then Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, into India. All those countries were, uh, were stable, quite safe, even Afghanistan. And I was able to make that journey in the winter of uh, 74, 75, and that was the best thing that I did. And I discovered that it was possible for the mind to be silent. Because, you know, initially when your mind is so restless, confused, 
agitated, you can't imagine the mind being, being silent, right? You can't imagine. But I was able to discover the silent mind. And I discovered what thinking was. Somebody lent me a book by a very, a very profound teacher. And I had told this uh, person, he was a fellow traveler, and I told him I was on a spiritual search and I was very curious about Buddhism, but I wasn't sure what it was. It seemed very ancient, very mysterious. So I wanted to investigate. And he said, have you heard about this teacher called J. Krishnamurti? No, I've never heard of him. And yet he's, he had been around a long time. He's a very profound teacher. And what is interesting about J. Krishnamurti is that he, he did not belong to any religion, but what he taught was the Dhamma. So he lent me this book and I began reading it. And there he explained what thinking was. And I was so amazed when I read his explanation, because it was so simple, and it should be taught in school. <laughs> Thinking is related to three things in the mind. Memory, past experience, and knowledge, information. You can see the connection, don't you? Memory, past experience, knowledge, information. And when I began to reflect on this and observe the mind itself, it was so obvious. As we, as we say, it's not rocket science. <laughs> it's not rocket science, it's so clear. And they, this is why they should be teaching this in school at least in high school level. You can see that memory, past experience, knowledge, information. So every time we think, we keep recycling the information that's stored in the mind. You can see that. And thinking has that ability to project in the future, right? You can see that all our minds do this. We're either thinking about something related to the past or we are projecting in the future. All our minds do this. So thinking is a movement in time from past to future, past to future. And it doesn't matter what language we think in, whether it's Cantonese, Hokkien, Mandarin, Russian, Japanese, French, it's the same thought process, moving in time. And it is this thought process that creates the sense of I, huh? me. And this is something the Buddha realized. He was the first person to have this insight. Because the belief in a permanent, separate self, this me center, this ego, all the ancient civilization believed this, that this me self was permanent. simply because they were trapped in thinking. They did not have the, the awareness, the insight that the Buddha had. And of course, when we are trapped in thinking, we think that the I, the me is permanent. And that's how we ask that age-old question. 
what happens to me when I die, and where do I go after death. And uh, this teacher also said that meditation is the ending of thought, ending of thinking. It is a movement in silence and the unknown. Now, what is interesting is that if I had not had that experience of silence, which happened about 10 days previously in North India, and I read this, meditation is the ending of thought, ending of thinking, it's a movement in silence on the unknown. I would have said, this is rubbish. Not possible, not possible for the mind to be silent. But because there was that experience of silence, which came very uh, naturally, without effort, without desire, I could understand it. Because, as you know, you cannot force the mind to stop thinking, right? And many yogis, during the Buddha's time, after the Buddha's time, try to stop thinking by force. And I think that's how migraine headaches began. <laughs> It's like there are some unskillful teachers. They tell the students, you sit there and you try not to think of anything. <laughs> yes. It's like telling somebody, try not to think of a pink elephant with blue polka dots wearing a yellow hat. <laughs> try not to think of that. <laughs> Not skillful. Because as you know, skillful practice, right mindfulness, is observing thoughts, letting them come and go. But the important thing, you're not attached to them. You just see thoughts as just thoughts. Because thoughts and images are always creating stories, right? Endless stories. Some of these stories are like mini dramas, Right? Worries, fears, this might happen, that might happen, and so on. And when we're not mindful, of course, these mind-created stories, the mini-dramas, the worries, fears, they seem so real, right? They seem so real, so permanent. Well, that's the power of delusion, the power of mental delusion. But when we apply mindfulness, we see that there are only thoughts. And you know that noting method, only thinking, thinking, thinking. It's a very useful technique, only thinking, thinking, thinking. Because it makes us to realize those stories, those worries, those fears are really just thoughts, that's all. They're not solid reality. And that's how we deal with unpleasant memories. Because we all have unpleasant memories, right? And as you know, you can, you can remember something that happened a long time ago, and you can still get upset, right? And you can still have regrets, you can still have guilt. And those unpleasant memories, again, they seem so real, so solid, so permanent, simple because there are emotions involved, right? But the miracle, mindfulness, we're able to see those unpleasant memories as just thoughts and images that are happening now, in the present moment. They may be related to past experiences, past events, 
but the actual experience of those unpleasant memories are actually just thoughts and images that are happening now. Hmm? Only thinking, thinking, thinking. Hmm? And you come back to present moment awareness and you let them go. This is a miracle of mindfulness, present moment awareness, Buddha nature or Buddha nature. This is the real refuge in, in the Buddha nature, having the trust, the confidence in Buddha nature. So thinking itself, as we said, it has its purpose in daily life but it is limited and as you know thinking can become very irrational very illogical hmm? when it gets obsessive worrisome and when it becomes negative right negative hmm? just like when we have guilt when we have regrets we have guilt And this is why it's very important when we make mistakes, we have to forgive ourselves for being human. Because as human beings, we are not perfect. And everyone makes mistakes, everyone, including monks, even famous monks. <laughs> Because monks are human beings. So we have to forgive ourselves for being human. Because the idea of perfection is only an idea. It's just a concept. So this is why the practice of loving kindness is very beneficial in dealing with guilt. And guilt is related to fear. Because when we feel guilty, when we are blaming ourselves for making mistakes, we create a negative image of ourselves, don't we? Hmm? I'm so terrible, I'm so awful, I'm so stupid. Right? Why did I do that? Why did I say that? I should have done that, I should have said this, blah, 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 blah. So that negative image and those negative judgmental thoughts create fear, conflict in the mind. But when we do loving kindness practice, we replace those negative judgmental thoughts with kind, positive thoughts. Is very, very beneficial. Hmm? And may I be well, happy, and peaceful. May I be free from fear, conflict, and delusion. May all beings be well, happy, and peaceful. May all beings be free from fear, conflict, and delusion. And of course, thinking creates duality, duality in the mind. I'm sure you've heard about duality because it's a part of our conditioning. And one of the great benefits of mindfulness or present moment awareness is that it's a state of non-duality. And so we're able to see things more objectively, see things as they are, and let them go. And know that they're impermanent. Now, what is duality? In case you're not sure. Duality begins very early in life, very innocently. When a young child Is, uh, is speaking, is learning language. 
And the child says, I like this, I don't like that. I want this, I don't want that. That already is duality in the mind. Duality means subject and object, right? Subject, object. And the I is always the subject. Hmm? Do you see that? Right? Always I. I like this, I don't like that. I want this, I don't want that. You, you see the duality? Subject, object. Just reflect on it if you don't see it. And this duality becomes more deep-rooted in the mind when we begin to identify with all our sense experiences. Hmm? When the mind says, I am seeing something, I am hearing something, I'm smelling something, I'm tasting something, I'm feeling something by touch, and of course, I'm thinking something. Very interesting. And this was one of the insights of the Buddha. He saw that our senses were actually sensing by themselves. There's really no one behind it. Very profound. There's no I who's actually seeing something. There's no I that's hearing something. That's smelling something, tasting something, feeling something by touch. And there's no I who's thinking thoughts. Very profound. Let us do a very simple example. Let's, let's close your eyes for a moment. Close your eyes for a moment. Okay. Close your eyes. Here, okay, there's no seeing. Now open your eyes. Open your eyes. What happens? Seeing arises. <clears throat> seeing arises automatically, doesn't it? Do you see what I'm trying to show you? You don't have to make an effort to see. It just happens. As long as your eyes are healthy, you just look and seeing arises. It's like you don't have to make a special effort to hear the speaker. All right? As long as your ears are clear and healthy, there's only hearing. But again, we use language and we say, I am seeing something. You know, say, I'm seeing a tree. Hmm? Hmm? It's an apple tree or banana tree, durian tree, mango tree. Hmm? I like it. I don't like it. So by doing that, you create a duality between there's a seer, an observer, that is separate from the tree. Whereas initially, there's only the seeing of the tree. Hmm? But when you say, I am seeing the tree, you know, I like it, I don't like it, blah, 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 you create a duality between the seer, the observer, that is separate from the tree. Very profound insight that the Buddha had. The senses are actually sensing by themselves. And of course, when you're on a retreat, you can see this more easily, right? When your mind is very quiet, clear, you're in the present moment, and you're not checking your smartphone, for heaven's sake. <laughs> you see it. There's no center of experience. There's only experience. Very profound. So regarding mindfulness, uh, present moment awareness is a state of non-duality, meaning there's no I who is being aware. Hmm? There's no I who is being mindful. There's only that energy of attention. Now, initially, we don't see that because we're busy thinking, I, 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 this, I, this, I, this. But when your mind is very calm, very clear, you can see that there's only awareness, there's only attention. And the great miracle of this state of awareness, we're able to see, say, anger as just anger. 
instead of saying I am angry, there is anger. There is a state of anger. You see the difference? Instead of saying I'm afraid or I'm frustrated, I'm upset, you see, there is upset. Hmm? There is frustration. There is fear or there's a state of fear. This is very liberating. And now the modern psychotherapists are using this method. As you know, they're calling it mindfulness-based psychotherapy. You see something as it is, objectively, and you know it is impermanent. It's a temporary mental state, a changing condition of the mind. And it's amazing to think that the Buddha taught this over 2,500 years ago. Quite amazing. The ability to see something as it is, instead of reacting to it and identifying with it. Even desire, when there is some form of desire or craving, we're able to see there is desire, there is craving. And this too shall pass. So in other words, desire itself is something very natural in the human condition. Hmm? The wanting mind. And it starts very young. And those who have had young children can identify with this. When a child is around uh, 10 months, 9, 10, 11 months, you know, they're getting more, uh, more active. They're learning to, to stand, to walk, to be more mobile. They're more aware of the environment. And everything they see is interesting, right? And they want to play, they want to touch, they want to play with everything. And if a child is playing with something, and you take it away from them, what do they do? They cry, don't they? Or if they want to play with something, and you prevent the child from, from having it, they cry. See, so that wanting mind begins very early, very early. And of course, when a, a child is learning to speak, of course, you know, I want this. You know, I like this, I don't like that. I want this. And of course, sometimes a child says, no, right? No. <laughs> so that's where the the grasping mind starts. And when the child begins to learn the word my, you know, my toy, you're my mommy, hmm? that is the, the beginning of attachment. Hmm? The, idea that, uh, the idea that something or someone belongs to me. Hmm? The, the grasping. The holding on, that's where it starts, the attachment. And of course, we all went through this, but maybe you're too young to remember this. <laughs> we all went through this when we were young. That's how it starts. And of course, as we get older, and the, and the mental identification becomes stronger and stronger. This duality that we're conditioned with, then we believe huh? that if I, can, if I can get what I want, I'll be happy. And if I don't get what I want, I'm not going to be happy. I'm going to be miserable. 
And initially we think, if I get what I want, I'm going to be happy for the rest of my life. <laughs> or I'm going to be unhappy for the rest of my life. Because we don't understand the truth of impermanence, right? But later we, we begin to see the truth of impermanence. That happiness comes and goes, unhappiness comes and goes. Frustration comes and goes. Fear comes and goes. And there is a very clear reason why all our experiences are impermanent or subject to change. And a very obvious reason is we are this process of body and mind, of rupa and nama. Right? I'm sure you all heard this teaching before. Rupa and nama, nama and rupa. And we're alive because we are this process. It's a very complex process, but that's why we're alive. If we were not a process, we wouldn't be alive. And initially, when you hear that we're this process of body and mind, mind and body, it's just an idea. We don't really see it clearly. But when we apply mindfulness, we're, when we bring our minds to the present moment, we begin to see this very clearly. For example, if you're doing mindful breathing, the physical sensation of the breath, that is the body, rupa, and the awareness of the physical sensation is mind. Mm -hmm. Nama. You see rupa and nama. And this is one of the forest practices in the forest tradition to see rupa and nama in all your daily activity. And initially, if you're doing something, if you're moving, for example, uh, mindful walking, you can see it very clearly. The feet moving and touching is rupa, the physical, and the awareness of the feet moving and touching is the mind, nama. You see, body and mind, physical and mental. No I, no me. And if you're eating mindfully, the same thing. The experience of tasting, chewing, swallowing is the physical rupa. And the awareness of the tasting, chewing, swallowing is mind. There's physical and mental phenomena. Rupa and Nama. And if you're doing the dynamic meditation, I think some of you already know this practice. The hands moving and touching the body. That is the Rupa, the physical. And the awareness of the hands moving and touching is mind. 
only body and mind. Again, no I, no me. Only Rupa and Nama. And what is very interesting is that it's very easy to overlook this fact that we're this process of body and mind. And because we're a process, of course, we have to keep recharging it. Same way you recharge your smartphones. Same way, right? You have to keep recharging it. But it's very easy to overlook this fact simply because we are social creatures. And we use language, we use names. You know, I, you, he, she, and names, right? You know, Go, Tan, Lim, whatever, Bante. And because we, we're caught in the social world, we tend to see ourselves as, you know, personalities, right? As egos, as selves. But when we apply mindfulness, come back to the present moment, you see the reality of just body and mind. It's very profound, but at the same time, it's, very, it's a very direct teaching. This is very direct. So if you ask me who's sitting here speaking, this body and mind. Because on the social level, I can say, you know, I'm Bhante Kovida from Canada. But at a deeper level, only Rupa Nama, Nama Rupa, okay? And we are all Nama Rupas here, all Nama Rupas sitting here, <laughs> regardless of your social label of who you are. It's Nama Rupas. Very profound, but at the same time, it's very direct. It's a very direct teaching. And again, this is an aspect of our Buddha nature, the Buddha nature present moment awareness. We can see that. And then you go a bit deeper, we have the five aggregates, or the five factors that create uh, our experience. Maybe later we can go into the five aggregates, because you go a bit deeper, you have the 32 body parts, you can always find a list of them somewhere, and you go a bit deeper, and you have the six elements, the six elements, very profound. And what's interesting about the six elements is that initially when we hear that we're composed of these elements, it's just an idea. It's just an idea. But when you go through the body and see what parts of the body are related to what elements, then the truth of the elements becomes more clear. And then you begin to realize that we exist because of these elements. And when you reflect on the elements on a regular basis, you come to the stage where you realize we're just a collection of elements pretending to be people. Just think about that for a while. <laughs> we're a collection of elements pretending to be people. And this collection of elements sitting here is pretending to be Bante Kovida from Canada. But it's, it's all pretending, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and your collection of elements is pretending to be who you are or who you think you are. <laughs> but in the end, it's all pretending. And if you really want to know what continues after death, which, which is the million dollar question, or the mil million ringgit question, it's the elements. Hmm? They go back to nature. Hmm? They go back to nature. So maybe another time, next, next month, we will have more time to go into this, into the elements. So this is the is the I call it the miracle and the wonder of mindfulness, present moment awareness, or Buddha nature. And the more we practice the more we have understanding, there's more trust, the more confidence in, in the Buddha nature and in the refuge of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Okay, okay so at, at this time, are there any questions? Any questions? <laughs> Why do we have to pretend we're here? Well, actually, we don't have to pretend. We're just here. Well, the important thing is not to be attached, not to be attached to even experience. And to know that there's no permanent I who is actually experiencing something. There's only experience. I'll give you a good example. Have you noticed when you reach a certain age and you look back on your life, if you have a good memory, and somehow, all your past memories, all the things you've been through, they seem more and more dreamlike. Have you noticed that? I said, did I really experience those things? Did I really go here and there, you know, and so on and so forth? Because it's something that I've realized myself. It seems more and more dreamlike. Even those many experiences in India, you know, Nepal, all these places, you know, um, Iran and, and uh, Pakistan, they seem more and more dreamlike. And the reason for this is related to what we've been speaking about, because there was no permanent I who was experiencing those things. But initially you think, you know, that this is I, you know, experiencing all these things including, you know, being in India, Pakistan, Iran, all those things. I experience those things because when you're relating your stories, of course, you're always saying I, right? I went here, I went there, I met so-and-so, I had this experience, I realized that. But what is interesting is that there was no permanent I who was actually experiencing those things. There was only experience. Hmm? Or the I that we thought was experiencing those things was only a label that we're using. And actually when you're mindful, you begin to see that every time you say I, this I is just a thought. It's just a thought. It's just a label that we use. But initially, we don't see that because we're conditioned always to be thinking. We identify with thinking. And every time you say I, you think this I is who we are, right? And it's always 
very important. It is at the center of all our experiences, including, you know, what we see, hear, smell, taste, what we think, and so on. And of course, I like this, I don't like that. And so, you know, all our preferences. Because this is a part of our conditioning, the identification. And what the Dhamma is teaching us, that as human beings, we have this unfortunate habit of identifying with everything, whether it's mental, emotional, or physical. And why it's unfortunate is, is because what, whatever we identify with happens to be impermanent. Right? It keeps changing. Right? Whether it's mental, emotional, or physical. It keeps changing. Because we are this process of body and mind, rupa nama. Very profound. But when we, when we reflect on it, you see the truth of it. You know, the Buddha nature is there. Yeah. Okay? Yes. No, in, in Pali language is different. Nama is your mental experience, including awareness, including your the feeling you get, your sensation you get. Whatever you perceive, which is related to a memory, past experience, because I, I didn't go through the five things, the five aggregates. And this is why I like to clarify what, what perception is. Because it's a bit vague for some people, perception, and the way we use the language. But basically, perception is the ability to identify a sense object. Good example, you listen to the radio and you hear a song, right? If you recognize the song, and sometimes the artist, the singer, that is perception of the work. You're not only hearing the song, but you recognize it. Which means perception is related to memory and previous experience. See that? So that's a part of Nama, your mental activity. And of course, in Malaysia, this part of the world, the perfect example is the smell of durian. Right? You can all relate to that, right? Everybody's smiling, right? Durian. <laughs> See, I didn't grow up with durian. And I tell you, it was very unpleasant, my first encounter. <laughs> but I got used to it, and now I'm the unofficial durian king, okay? <laughs> but the point I'm making even if you travel abroad, overseas, the moment you smell durian, you know exactly what it is, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I had some when I came in October. <laughs> okay. So, that's, so it's good to reflect on uh, perception. And I like to give the example of, you know, in North America, we have a few large Chinatowns, like San Francisco, Vancouver, Toronto, New York, right? And in these Chinatowns, you can get all these fruits from, from Malaysia, from Southeast Asia. And I say that because many white Americans or white Canadians, when you go to Chinatown and see, you know, durian, uh, mangis, rambutan, Many of them have no idea what these fruits are. 
But if you go or I go, we know, right? It's like that. So in other words, in, in the five aggregates, there are four things that are related to nama, including consciousness. And of course, our mental reaction, right? Mental formation is a part of nama. And consciousness is always changing. Because a common mistake, we think that consciousness is something permanent. And when we die, this permanent consciousness continues and it takes rebirth. But that's not correct. Because if you understand the changing nature of consciousness, you realize it cannot take rebirth. And these five things are interdependent, interconnected, which means that they work together. So you, you cannot separate consciousness from the other four factors. But next week we can go more into this. And this is why I like to give a simple example of these five things working. Because normally when we first hear or read about these five things, they seem a bit complicated. You know, physical form, feeling sensation, perception, mental reaction, and consciousness. Very complicated. And we don't see how they're related to our daily experience. But when I give that simple example, then you can relate to it. So these five things are working all the time in daily life, but we're just not aware of them because they happen so quickly. They happen very quickly, but they're interdependent, interconnected, and there's no permanent I, no permanent self who's actually behind these five things. Very profound. But later we'll go into the nature of consciousness. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, speaking for the practice about in this modern world, in this yes. Yes. You know, I consider myself very fortunate that I, I, I didn't have children. I didn't have to worry about them. <laughs> I'm just being honest. And you know, when I see how people are getting more addicted to the smartphone, more anxious, more impatient, I, I've just spent 30 days in Singapore. And they're already very anxious, very, very uh, impatient. And this WhatsApp technology is making them even more, right, anxious and impatient. And I guess people in KL are also suffering from that. And I'm the age now, I can't worry myself and stress myself about all I can do is keep 
reminding people the benefits of mindfulness. And we can practice some form of discipline or balance. Even to put your, your phone away, even for 10 minutes. And to understand that behind that, that addiction, and it's not only young people, right? Everybody in the working world are, are caught in this. For example, when you have lunch, put your phone away and just eat mindfully without it. And you see that it's very peaceful. It's a very peaceful experience, even for 10, 15 minutes. And in that, that silence and peace of just eating by yourself, that's a very healthy way of, of letting go of this, the general stress, you know, just from the work environment. But, they, but it's up to them, of course. You, you can only advise them. It, it's up to them. And to see, yes, you can do miracles with the smartphone, but also to know that it also has its unhealthy side too. And as you may know, there are some people in Japan, you might have seen it on YouTube, you know, they're, they're still fairly young, like in their 20s, maybe early 30s, and they just drop out of society. They're just, they're just too overwhelmed and they feel they can't keep up. And they see themselves as being failures in the Japanese society. And they just stay indoors. And you can imagine they're, they're on internet, right? They're in the virtual world. But at least it's good to know that there are a few individuals, very compassionate people, who are trying to help these people. And the first step is to get these people together and to share their mutual experience. Because initially, each of them thought that I was the only one huh, who felt like this. But by meeting other people who are experiencing the very same thing is already very um, beneficial. And to share their experiences and see how they can, they can cope and how they can still go out into the world but still have a sense of, uh, of balance, find some balance. Yes, you're not going to be a top CEO for a company, blah, 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 you know, but you just live moderately, be satisfied with what you have, be content like that. So that was, so that's my answer. Yeah, that's my answer. Okay. First of all, um, I'd rather use the word heat as opposed to fire. Why? Because when we hear the word fire, uh, we, we think of, you know, a burning fire with smoke. <laughs> but actually it's heat. And you can experience the heat, right? Heat element. Uh, the other two elements is um, space, the element of space, the element of consciousness. And why space is considered an, LA, an element, because there's space inside the body and space outside the body. And without space, nothing could exist. And when you go out there, there's, you know, vast, unimaginable space. It's quite amazing. And consciousness is considered the sixth element because without consciousness, and consciousness, you, you may remember, it's always related to the senses, right? Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking. So consciousness, without consciousness, via the senses, we wouldn't be aware of life and daily experience. 
and we wouldn't be aware of the other five elements. There, there's, a, um, there's a video where I, I reflect on the, the senses from here. So go to um, yeah, Bhante Kovida Buddhist Gem Fellowship. You, you'll see that video. But it's labeled five elements reflection. But it's really six. It's really six elements. Ha ha. <laughs> Put it this way. Elements go back to nature, as I mentioned, when the body mind process shuts down. Okay? And this is another interesting thing about the teaching of Rupa Nama, Nama Rupa, is that when there's a death, we normally say somebody dies or somebody passes away, right? But that is our human language, human convention. Somebody dies, somebody passes away. But at a deeper level, it's the body-mind process simply shutting down. It shuts down. Okay? And on the level of the five aggregates, the five factors that create our daily experience, these five things simply stops working. Hmm? So you're seeing that at, at a deeper perspective. Okay? Now, the first element to go is the heat element, heat of fire. And this is why if you touch a dead body, it feels cold. Because the heat element is the first element to go. Now, at a deeper level than the elements, you have atoms. Now, in the Buddha's time, they were not aware of atoms and molecules. But now we know. They're atoms and molecules. And atoms are often referred to as cosmic energy. Why? Because everything is composed of atoms, including everything that we can see in this room, including people, atoms. And you, you may recall the, the first law of science that we learned in high school. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. You remember that? It can only change its form and it can move from one place to another. So on that profound level of uh, reflection, one is able to go beyond the idea of birth and death at that deep level. They're very profound. And an interesting uh, aspect of atoms is that they're recycled. They're recyclable. So all the atoms that are in our bodies at this moment have been recycled many, many, many times. Just think about it. For example, there are a few atoms in our bodies at this moment that were once in the bodies of dinosaurs that existed millions of years ago. Just think about it. So we're actually related to dinosaurs. <laughs> Very interesting. And because we're, you know, 70% water, a lot of our atoms right now were once recently in the sky. Think of it. Because, you know, we're always drinking, right? As water vapor, clouds, rain. And in cold countries, no. That's right. And even if you have never left Malaysia, it's interesting to know that all our atoms, they've been around the planet many, many times because of, you know, weather, patterns in weather. And here's one more interesting fact about molecules. It's possible that there's one atom in our bodies right now that was once in the body of somebody well-known, 
long, long time ago. Just think of it. It's possible there's one atom in our bodies that was once in the body of somebody well known long, long time ago. <laughs> to give an example, Jenny Skung. You know Jenny Skung? Of the Mongols, because he's one of our ancestors. <laughs> Whether you want to accept it or not. <laughs> he was one of our ancestors. And you know, he, he rode around in his army. They moved around, right? A lot. You know, they rode all the way to Europe, you know? And think of somebody like Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar from the Roman Emperor, Empire. It's possible. I think of somebody like Jesus of Nazareth, otherwise known as Jesus Christ. And yes, it's possible that there's one atom in our bodies that was once in the body of the Buddha himself. Think of it. Think of it. But it doesn't mean that we're enlightened. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it's just the nature of atoms. Yeah. Very interesting. I hope that has that have answered your question. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? Dreams, yes. Actually, it's very simple. I guess you've never really investigated this from earlier, earlier times, and you've not investigated it. Because since early childhood, I've always had, you know, vivid dreams. And every so often, I'll meet somebody who said, who said to me, I don't dream. Some people tell me that. I don't dream or I can't remember my dreams. It's actually very simple. And part of it is, is again, reflect on what I said about the nature of thinking. Memory, past experience, knowledge, knowledge information, okay? That's a part of our conditioned mind, the conscious mind, conditioning. Because awareness is something different, right? The, the nature of consciousness is that it's always changing. And when we go to sleep at night and we fall asleep, we're in the deep sleep state. And the deep sleep state is usually around one to two hours for adults. For younger children, it's uh, longer. And in the deep sleep state, there is no consciousness. That's right. We actually die hmm? mentally, psychologically, every night. Because we're not aware of anything. The world as we know it does not exist. Very interesting. This is why there's an old saying that some of you might remember when somebody's in deep sleep and they're not aware of anything, we say that person is dead to the world. Have you ever heard that saying? Some people can remember that, even in Malaysia. Hmm? We say somebody is dead to the world, meaning they're not aware of anything. Because in that deep sleep state, Malaysia does not exist. Even your family, even your house you're not aware of, even your bedroom. Only say if you wake up in the night, 
course, you're aware of your, of your bedroom, but when you're in deep sleep, nothing. Now, when the brain comes out of that deep sleep state after one, two hours, then the thought process starts up again. And that's what we call the dream state. That's when dreams begin to happen. And if you observe your mind, you'll see that most of our dreams are just memories all mixed up. Have you ever noticed that? Including, you know, some fantasy. All mixed up. And sometimes, say, if you're having some conflict in your life, you know, whether it's work or with, you know, people, family, whatever, your neighbor, sometimes that conflict will come in your dream. Or anxiety. We can all relate to having an anxious dream, right, sometimes. And, of course, sometimes a nightmare. And why this is so is simply because thinking is related to memory. So when the thought process starts up again after the deep sleep state, then all this mixture of memory information comes up in dreams. Very, very interesting. And you'll notice that if you have some important event coming up, say an interview or some anything that's important, very often we dream about it. Have you noticed that? Including, say, you're taking a trip somewhere. And you're excited, right, about going somewhere. Very often, you dream about it. And sometimes you dream, you know, that you get to the airport and it's all confusing and you missed your flight. <laughs> right? And you wake up, ah, oh, thank God, thank God. <laughs> or sometimes you're in real trouble, right, in your dream. This is it now, this is the end. And then you wake up, ah, oh, thank God, right? It's like that. Or you have those dreams where something exciting is going to happen, right? I remember once I had this very vivid dream, and in the middle of the dream, suddenly I had a strong desire for a certain type of food, right? And the rest of the dream, I go through this James Bond-like adventure, right? <laughs> Real James Bond adventure, to get this food. And finally, I get this food in my hot little hands, and I'm, I'm about to bite into it. And you know what happens? <laughs> you wake up. Not even a bite. <laughs> that is suffering. That is really suffering. <laughs> well, that's the nature of dreams. That's right. Okay. Well, actually, it's very simple. If you're meditating properly or correctly, right, you're observing thoughts, mental things, and you're learning how to let them go, right? You're training the mind to let them go. And then the mind becomes more calm, more peaceful, and it reaches a natural state of just awareness. So, in other words, you're training the mind to let go, not to cling so much, right? 
not to be attached to what the mind is, is creating, all our mental formations, mental objects, which means that there's more awareness. So this is why when you're practicing more regularly or you're on a retreat, you tend to dream less. It's simply because of that. Because you're learning to let go of mental objects, mental activity. Whereas before that, before practice, right, we're so involved with mental activity and we cling to them, we identify with them, right? Because this is what neurosis is. Neurosis is when, and we're all conditioned to have neurosis, meaning to have strong identification, attachment to thinking. And that includes our emotions. We, we identify with it and we think this is reality. That is a part of our conditioning. We're always reacting, right, to the world. You know, judging, as we said, judging, comparing, liking, not liking, criticizing, and so on. So it's this habit we all have of always reacting that creates our mental, emotional reality. And we think this is real. And what the Dhamma is showing us is that it's not real. And this is what is causing our dukkha, you know, mental, emotional problems, conflicts, right? And it is this conditioning that gives the illusion of a permanent, separate self. And then we get attached to it, to the permanent self, which creates, of course, dukkha, and more fear, more insecurity, and so on. Yeah. It's amazing, you know, you can be, you know, a so-called mature person, you know, 50, 60, even 70, and still be immature. Immature in the sense Physically, you may be mature, but mentally, emotionally, you're not mature because you're still clinging to the idea of self. And you're still thinking about your image, what people are thinking about you, you know, what people are talking about you, and all those things. This is why sometimes I don't like to use the word um, enlightenment, but rather I like to use the word spiritual maturity. Because spiritual maturity means you get to a stage where you stop taking yourself seriously. And you no longer believe that I'm at the center of the world or the universe. You can laugh at yourself. <laughs> that is wisdom. The wisdom of Anatta, no permanent, separate self. Okay? So maturity is really not about age. It's really your, your understanding, you know, right understanding, wisdom. Well, wait till you, until you get old. <laughs> I think at your age, yeah, you're asking the wrong question. Put it this way, before you might get dementia, because you might not get it, right? You're just protecting. In other words, the idea that you might get dementia or that you're going to have dementia, you look at it as only thinking, you're projecting the mind in the future. But the Dhamma is teaching us 
you be in the present moment and you practice so you understand you train your mind to let go of thoughts of mental formations let go of thinking because it is thinking that is creating dukkha all our mental uh, defilements are created by thinking when you investigate it's all thinking you know the grasping the clinging all the negativity the worry the fear frustration anxiety it's all based on thinking and this conditioning that we all have this i we all have a self but when we investigate we see it's all based on thinking and memory all collections of memory for example if you meet somebody for the first time and you talk about yourselves right when you talk about yourselves what do you talk about it's all personal history isn't it which is based on memory it's all history all memory just reflect on it in other words you you cannot speak about yourself without referring to personal history and memory and with that of course we have future projections you know plans hopes and dreams goals you like to attain and so on so that is part of the the conditioning mind the thinking mind but awareness is something different and this is why when somebody suffers from amnesia you know temporary memory loss why it is so confusing scary because when you lose your memory you don't know who you are hmm? just reflect on that when you lose your memory you don't know who you are because who you are or who we think we are is all based on memories now here's something interesting when you practice to come back to your question and you, you see the the importance of awareness that this is the unconditioned state of mind this is the buddha nature or wisdom mind even if say you're suffering from amnesia if you happen to be suffering from amnesia it won't be so scary it won't be so confusing why because you're more comfortable in the present can you see that you might not remember where you live or you know where your family are or your address and all that stuff but it won't be as scary because yeah, yeah because you're aware exactly because you're aware but just in case maybe later on if you happen to to be experiencing early signs of um, say alzheimers which has to do with the deterioration of the of the cells right you can try the, the coconut oil treatment do you know about this you don't use the internet <laughs> even this old dinosaur saw that in internet have you heard about this the coconut oil treatment i know you live in pj ayo <laughs> yeah no this is good quality coconut oil they did research the, the, there's a, an enzyme in good quality coconut coconut oil if it's taken in the early stages early stages of alzheimer's it helps to stop the de deterioration of the brain cells and one of the scientists who was involved in the research it was a scottish lady and while she was doing this research it happened that her husband was showing early signs of uh, alzheimer's so, so she used him naturally as the guinea pig and every morning because you know in scotland uk in cold countries they like to eat porridge but oats porridge 
not rice porridge, but oats porridge for breakfast. And of course, she would be making the oats porridge for him, and she would put, you know, maybe two uh, tablespoons of good quality uh, coconut oil, n not the frying coconut oil. And it actually arrested the deterioration of the brain cells. So maybe you can do some research. Okay? Google after this. <laughs> Just in case. Just in case. Somebody once asked, one of the last enlightened beings in India, his name was Ramana Maharshi from South India. And the story how he became awakened is another miracle. He was only 16, 17, you know, a teenager when he had this awakening, something very spontaneous. Anyway, in his later years, he was asked this question, you know, the age-old question we talk about. What happens to me when I die? Where do I go after death? Where does, you know, consciousness goes? And he gave the most wonderful answer. He says, tell me, when you go to bed at night and you fall asleep, where do you go? We come back, we come back to that state of the uh, deep sleep state. There is no consciousness. As I said, if you understand this teaching of nama rupa, rupa nama, you know, body mind process, that has the five factors that create our experience, and consciousness is one of them. Hmm? Hmm? Although we say somebody dies, somebody passes away, but at a deeper level, it's a body mind process simply shuts down, it stops working. Hmm? Just reflect on it. And then on the level of the five factors, the five aggregates of which consciousness is one, these five things simply stops working. So in other words, consciousness doesn't go anywhere. It's a part of the five things that work together in this process. Understand? So the question is now, why do we separate consciousness and say, ah, oh, where does consciousness go? Or consciousness, you know, continues after that, take rebirth. Why do we do that? Because we don't understand the teaching, you know, of the process and the five aggregates, how they work together, how they're interdependent, interconnected, and wishful thinking. Right? Because thinking is a part of consciousness. And we want thinking to continue somehow. Because thinking cannot relate to death and the unknown, the great unknown. Right? Thinking has always been a great unknown, a great mystery. And out of that great mystery and the unknown, that's why we have created the belief in ghosts and spirits. Hmm? And you wonder, you, you, you see the body of somebody, right, that you knew very well, and you're wondering, where has this person gone to, right? It's a great mystery. But you don't understand the, the process of rupa nama, nama rupa, and the five aggregates working together. And because we have this thing called the human imagination, which is very fertile, you say, oh, that person has become a spirit. Hmm? an invisible being, and it's living in the spirit world. And that's why we, we do offerings, right? We do offerings to the departed spirits. It's because of that. I mean, it's a nice way of, you know, keeping in touch, so to speak, to a departed spirit, but it comes from, from the imagination. Because we're faced with the great unknown, the great mystery. But really, it is thinking itself that is afraid to come to an end. Maybe next week we'll, we'll have time to go into it. 
Because thinking cannot relate to the unknown. That is the point. Thinking cannot relate to the unknown. Because it's always related to memory, experience, knowledge, information. Understand? Thinking can only relate to that which we know. So it cannot relate to the unknown. So there's fear. It's, it's like a fish cannot relate to the experience of riding a bicycle, right? Or driving a car or using internet. A fish cannot relate to those experiences. So in the same way, our thinking consciousness cannot relate to death and the great unknown. And that's why out of that fear, the unknown, we project beyond death, and this is why we create many beliefs in an afterlife. And humans have created many, many beliefs. And rebirth, reincarnation is only one belief. There are many, many, many. But later we can go into this, because this is a very fascinating subject. Okay? 